yeah, they are, it's not that hard of a pitch to get people. It's a really solid farming sim that kind of blends a little bit of the dungeon crawly RPG elements alongside some exploration and fantasy elements. Um, it starts off, you kind of get beckoned to this magical island that no one else can go to but somehow you make it there and then from there you kind of start over you get tossed your starting tools like a lot of other farm sims do and you kind of are given free reign to do whatever you want which i really liked it's one of those games that you're not shoehorned into hey you have to go do this then you got to go do this you know going from a to b to c it's hey, we're going to give you some intro quests to kind of introduce you to everyone, and you get to go out on your own. They don't hold your hand. They don't make you, you know, follow a certain path. They just let you farm, mine, whatever your, you know, heart desires, which a lot of people like myself really enjoyed. Um, so, yeah, once you kind of start going off it, the gameplay in terms of, like the RPG elements is pretty light. You have some enemies in like the dungeons that you can attack against, but it's nothing, nothing really insane. The majority of what people will be doing is like farming, gathering, collecting, mining that, that sort of stuff. Um, that, the premise of that though the farming feels great i really enjoyed it there's a lot of things to do <laughs> like that is not an understatement there are so many different um, vegetables you can grow there are so many different flowers you can plant you can breed plants to like you can put a white flower and a red flower leave a spot for soil in between them you can make a pink flower so there's like breeding stuff like that all of this leading to you being able to like decorate with some of the stuff you collect, which I'll get to later because that's its whole whole thing. But the, the biggest thing I, th I believe people will want to know is how is the farming sim routine? Because a lot of those games, you have a routine and a flow you kind of get into once you're in a bit to the game. The days go by really quickly. Like a lot of farm sims, you start of a morning, you work till midnight or whenever, and then the, the day resets. It's it's a pretty quick um, day. A lot of people had the same feeling I did where it was a little bit too fast. You kind of don't feel like you get to do enough. You're kind of like, hey, I, you end up kind of dedicating. It's, if you're trying to completely cover your bases, you'll kind of spend one or two days mining, then a couple of days catching up with your farming and then the gathering. Um and then you'll have some days where you'll spend it just socializing um, with the community and stuff like that. The days, yeah, it's about 20 minutes of in-game time or real life time for a day, which when you think about it is not that much to do what all you need to. Because you have farming, the mining the dungeons and then the whole social aspect there's an entire village where you can talk to romance become friends with that i feel like wasn't as fleshed out as what i think it should have been that was a big concern that i had talking about it in my review is a lot of the npcs that you meet and talk to you kind of just talk to them and there's not much else if you continually talk to them, you can become friends with them, which is kind of cool. There's no incentive to do that, which I think hurt the game a little bit. It didn't make me want to go out and become friends with everybody. Uh, they don't offer you anything. They don't gift no, you No, like literally there are friend quests that you can do, which I'll get to the quest system. Um, but there's friend quests that from my experience, I, it's like, hey, I'm feeling cold. It'd be great if I had a warming drink. And you can either hand it to him if you have one on you or you can go craft one. But then it just gives you like ding a ling ling. You know, you you did a friend quest. Um, 
And you get nothing for it? Nothing. Like, significant that I picked up on. Uh, there might have been like I'm assuming there's got to be some XP. That's what I was going to say. There has to be like some XP or something. There, There's not any XP for like social socializing. It's most of your XP that you gather is from... Um, so like you can do mines, uh, like pickaxe. You can dig uh, holes with a shovel. There are like shrubbery with a sickle that you can slice. Um, then fishing and bug catching. Those are the main kind of activities you can do. The more you do them, you'll gain XP that way. So it's got kind of like that MMO where if you just cut a bunch of trees, your axe chopping level will go up. And you might... Um, so you can either like, hey, my axe is going to do more damage now, so it requires less hits to cut down a tree, or I get more logs whenever I cut a tree down. So it's one of the, but like socializing, there wasn't much of a point, even like taking from the friendship uh, aspect, you can romance people, but it was a very unorganic feeling when talking to some of these characters. It's mostly if you just chat with them a couple times, you get a quest like, hey, go on a date with this person if you want to. And that's about it. It didn't feel organic. It didn't feel like it's just like, hey, if you think this is a cool character, you can go talk to him a bunch. And then, hey, you can be a romance if you want to. It's speed dating. That's what that sounds like to me. You know, you just, you just talk to a person and is. boom. Hey, do you, do you want to date, date the person? Yep. That they even like they break it up also into quests. There's a lot of quests in this game. Uh, and the romance quests are kind of like the friend quest where it's like hey i'm it's really hot outside i could go with a cooling beverage could you bring me one and it's like hey you get some stars ding ding ding, ding for uh for romance or for friends um my speaking of the quest system like i was talking about there's a lot of main quests there's some side quests job quests that can rank you up um in varying ways um had some issues with it uh, just personally that i didn't like as a solo player um i talked about it in my review but overall this game thrives with multiplayer if you're a solo player it's gonna tie engage you a lot you're gonna it's a very slow progression um mainly because you can only pick up and complete one job quest at a time so if one of the quests is like, hey, go out and mine like 10 silver ores. Just throwing that out there. Um, there can be another job quest that um, that another citizen of the village is going to give you this. Like, hey, if you go catch this rare fish, you'll earn a level with me kind of thing. So let's say you're on your way. You pick up the quest for... The silver ore. You're like, okay, cool. I'm gonna go do that one. You run by the ocean. You see a rare fish. And you're like, hey, that'd be great. I could catch this and then go turn them in. Once I get done mining, you can't. You you can't complete one or carry two active quests at the same time. So it's you literally are having to run, go do something, run back, pick up something, go to complete it. Which I didn't like. I, I would rather you know you just let me pick up these quests. Even if it's like th holding three at a time, um, I think would have been a much more uh, forgiving experience for solos, especially with some of the rare items that you have to find. But yeah, that that was a big complaint of mine. Was just I I don't understand why that was a a odd choice for me to only pick up and turn in one active quest. Um, but yeah, so other than that, when you say, sorry, I just want to yeah. clarify what an active quest is. Is that considered kind of a main quest? So say you have the, the go into the mine and collect 10 silver ores. But if you wanted to romance somebody and start that quest, would that be considered a 
main quest or you know active quests it's, so you can't it's do for that your job it's for the Only specifically jobs. the jobs yeah okay. and the jobs right. is kind of what you want to prioritize because those can actually give you some incentives with like bonuses to do um and each most of the main citizens that you'll run into um have their own tier of job quests so your main quest is fine uh, it's in your side quest. It's your job quest, which is what you'll spend a lot of your time doing because that's kind of like your day-to-day -day stuff. Um, those, you can only pick up one at a time. You can see what the next one is going to be for other vendors, but you can't pick it up and turn it in. And it's not retroactive. So if you go and caught a rare fish, if you went and picked up that quest, you'd have to go catch another one. If that makes sense, it just it felt like a great tool for multiplayer. Like, hey, you go grab this one, I'll go grab this one. We'll turn them in, you know, that kind of thing. We'll work on this together. But as a solo player, you're just running all over the place trying to turn everything in. Um, but yeah, the farming. There's so much to do in terms of gathering, crafting. Um, even decorating, you'll have your house like most of your farming sims, and there are tons of really cool um, and unique um, decoration items and cosmetics that you can put, and some of them give you specific boosts, like you can have more energy if you put these certain um, decorations inside these certain furniture sets. So that was cool. I, I really liked that. They're all depending on what you get the material from they'll be themed kind of um to that area like there's one of very like fantasy-esque um which is called the fey realm all the materials that you gather up if you craft them into decoration items and furniture and stuff like that it's themed like that area looks which is really cool um so as far yeah, that, as the story goes, is is there much of one? Is it just not, more leading you into the, the whole sim thing? There is like, an overarching story, and it's basically, hey, there is these whirlpools that are blocking people from coming into the island, the mainland, whatever, this, this land of Azoria. And you're asked to, hey, while you're starting your new life, since you're kind of stuck here, um, could you maybe check it out and see what's causing it? And then you realize that there's a little bit more going on with the island than what it first seems. But it basically doesn't go into much more than that. There is four main dungeons that you'll go through. They kind of give you a little bit more story about the island, but it kind of really just lets you make your own story, if that makes sense, once you get to the island with how you interact with the villagers and other people of the land. So what do you think the percentage of dungeon crawling to farm sim roughly is? It really depends on what the player is wanting to do more of. Like, you can skim by and barely do any dungeon, and you could go, I would say, 70 to 30 on farming to dungeon. Um, but there is... You can do a lot of material... You can do a lot more with materials if you explore the dungeon more. You have to explore um, to, like, a certain floor level of each dungeon to progress to the next one to like unlock it but mm, i would say it's probably 60 to 40 for the average um maybe 50 50 dungeon time to farming it's like I said, it's really tough to gauge that with because everybody's gonna play this game differently i think i i love me the rpg i love the dungeon crawling so i spend a lot of time in the dungeons and not a lot of time farming um, just because well, that's I was cool trying. that they give you the option yeah it's because you can make your money I made a lot of my money to like buy um, new things by mining 
and going through the dungeons on multiple times and kind of grinding that. But the same thing goes for like the farming aspect. You can put all your time into farming and selling money that way to you know expand your little plot of land. It, it's a really cool kind of freedom that they give you with you know do I want to do dungeons? Do I want to farm? Do I want to do a little both? You know you're not like I said you're not shoehorned into one gameplay style. Now, do you think, uh, obviously, you know, Animal Crossing, that's the big switch uh, Mm -hmm. RPG, like, not really RPG, but simulation game that's out there. Do you feel like fans of that, that they're looking for the next thing to play? I mean, Animal Crossing is never really done, but obviously after a couple years, you're looking for something new to play. Do you think this is a good, I don't want to say replacement, but a good next game to pick up to keep you going? I think that if you are a fan of Animal Crossing, then you will be a fan of Fate Farm. And it is a good, like you said, it's not a replacement, but it's like, hey, Animal Crossing 2 is not coming out for a bit. I've already put 500 hours into Animal Crossing 1. I think Fate Farm is a good new adventure for for fans of the series to to try out. It's got a lot of good things going for it. Um, like I said, I really loved the decoration, the customization options. The game's colorful. It's wonderful. Um, you can put a lot of time into adventuring, gathering, exploring, just like Animal Crossing. There's, I, I put in probably 40 hours. I could easily see people putting over 100, 150 into this if they wanted to really you know, do everything and kind of farm to its fullest. It, it offers a lot of game time um, for those kind of players who love that. They'll just sink hours upon hours into it. Um, so it's got a lot of things going for it. The only things that I personally didn't like was I didn't like the quest system. Um, I played solo, so I think it could use some tweaking for solo players. Um, then the citizens could do a little bit more personality when interacting, socializing and stuff and then some of the dungeons I think could be fleshed out a little bit better but overall um, yeah, especially if you got some friends who you played Animal Crossing with um, being able to play together and like plot land together and farm and do things at the same time with their I mean, multiplayer for, system. For this one, like, the multiplayer, the Animal Crossing doesn't even have a regular multiplayer, if I'm remembering right. Like, it's not as standard, so this is a lot more yeah, regular like you can go. Yeah, this is, you can do stuff together, which is a good selling point, um, especially when you think about all the, like I said, all the stuff you can do. There's so much farming, um, bug catching, all the activities that you, you know, standardize with a farm sim fishing crafting cooking all of that i think's done very solid i i really enjoyed it there's tons of stuff to do you won't get bored <laughs> you'll never run out of stuff to do if you know what i mean you always it does a really good job of making you feel like you're behind but not in a bad way. Like you're never caught up. If that makes sense, there's always something that you want to do or like, Hey, I need to go do this or I need to work on this. I can level up this next. So it's, it leaves that, I guess the hunger to keep playing. You know, you're like, I don't want to set this down. I got to keep going. So yeah, overall really solid game. You know what I want a farming sim to try to tackle one day? And this is probably impossible, but I think the idea is fun. I want a farming sim to include some sort of stock market. Like, some way to include some Like form an investment. Investment thing. Oh, just give GameStop a second to, like, come up with, like, something based on their whole entire <laughs> Game Stonks thing or whatever. Which they'll put you out, mean? you know, a month at like a year after people aren't. Yeah, so can say no, not a that's month. That's literally a GameStop year. strategy: is do things after everyone else has done them right. 
Yeah. Can, can you imagine Animal Crossing, Crossing with some sort of investment thing? It's like compound interest on your fruit. You know, like something, I, something wild and interesting. Or where it's not like, like I want to invite like the wild and weird capitalism that exists in the stock market, but you know something where it's where there's some sort of investment strategy where you can just put it there and leave it and you know 10 months later like you have 10,000 onions or something was it was it new world that balanced a lot of their economy by like how much players were harvesting like contributing like there weapons was, and stuff there was something like that but it wasn't necessarily like a Roth IRA of yeah. like things but there was yeah there was something similar where it was kind of like the entire server like contributed to this thing um uh, and i forget how it worked out but there was yeah i think it fooled around with it well, i know i really liked uh, moonlighter that one oh yeah it's not the exact same idea but the fact that you go that dungeon do? crawling get, you it's a roguelike roguelike dungeon crawler i think more or less uh you would go into a dungeon you would uh, kill things, pick up stuff, and then you would go back to your town and sell stuff in a shop. And it was like different stuff. It's not the exact same idea, but the stuff you'd put on sale, like some stuff, you'd have to set the price. Some stuff would be too high. Some stuff would be too low. You'd kind of go based off of some sort of economy, the game set, as to like whether or not you thought it was like whether you were giving stuff out at a fair price or whether you were losing money or charging too much and stuff. Like it was that really interesting. Like, the way that sounds, that sounds more like bartering, yeah? I mean, they were giving you money for stuff you were selling. Oh, I see. Like, yeah, so, but it was just really interesting, just the whole idea of, you know, you go crawl a dungeon, bring back stuff, and then throw it on your tables and price it depending on what the market kind of is at the moment. <laughs> I would I would love to see something like like that, but it'd be so tough to balance that market if you have like oh, an online yeah. component. It'd be so <laughs> yeah. incredibly tough. Um, I thought Fay Farm was going to have something like that. Um, one of the I guess citizens of Azoria was like, "Hey, there's this um, in town. There's a stand where you can just sell a certain number of items each night." whatever they sell for you know you'll collect in coins and i was like okay cool i know where that's a centralized location she's like hey yeah but if you also if you buy this particular stand um the way she talked was like hey this will be an investment and you can reap more and i was like oh sweet i can get like a basis of what like the produce sells for kind of like an investment thing but it's like, no we're just going to put that one of those stands beside your house so you don't have to walk as far to sell stuff and i was like you teasing me with this investment stuff because <laughs> I, I would have loved having that in the game. I just want to put some some money into Tom Nook's, you know, whatever Tom Nook company he would have f- fruit and houses. Oh, he'd probably have a housing market. That's probably what he would have. Yeah, invest in some turnips, you know, like stuff like that. I think that'd be a lot of fun. You'd, Tom Nook would rack people a lot of money because he's such oh, a jerk. Like- but we already know he's a jerk, so we just live with the fact yeah. that he's a jerk and reap some benefit from the jerkiness. At least, you know, if you're going to be a jerk, at least <laughs> hook me up in your jerkness. Yeah. Help me out a little bit. It's really funny that two military shooters come out for VR at almost the exact same time. I mean, these are days released apart. Still somehow managed to both be completely different and still managed to kind of not find their way. <laughs> uh, very, very interesting. Uh, also, for all of those listening, I apologize for the airport n- noises behind. Uh, occasionally, the overhead speakers go off when they're talking all about boarding um i was i was going to say to to the people (laughs) that uh 
David, you're going to have to be careful when you're talking about these now. You mentioned shooting <laughs> too much, you know, in an airport. <laughs> exactly. I don't want the security coming all of a sudden dragging you away. Your phone falls to the ground. David, no! <laughs> My bro sitting all alone in an airport with headphones on talking about shit. <laughs> <laughs> the multiple shooters that are coming out this year. As, long, as long as we don't bring up no Russian I think I'm safe <laughs> there are multiple shooters coming out this year guys <laughs> <laughs> but anyways so we're starting with firewall firewall is going for more of the rainbow six crowd is kind of the easiest way to put it uh, the previous game uh, was pretty pretty cool on PlayStation VR, but coming to PSVR 2, there were definitely some new features that they worked on uh, beyond just using the hardware to be even better. Uh, there were or have been some very interesting choices, uh, which myself and Ron, who were both working on this, did not agree on. <laughs> uh, they went with, for instance... Everybody that plays VR games, the, the immediate thought is, oh, I'm going to reach down to my belt, grab a mag, and put it in myself because it's a VR game. Not in Firewall. Firewall, you actually just button press to reload. Now, it makes sense to me because when I think about a competitive shooter, one that's very online focused, if it's just constantly having to try and reload, uh, it's just not going to work as well. Now, surprisingly, Pavlov VR, which we rated very highly uh, at the release on PSVR 2 during the launch, uh, it was actually really good even with that. Uh, Firewall, though, it is a lot easier when I can press a button and boom, I've already switched out a mag. Uh, same with grenade tosses, and this is actually something that most VR games to me get wrong there is something off with throwing things with throwing grenades in vr because most of the time i grab it and it's the hold hold your trigger button and then when you swing your arm around you release and that throws the grenade most of the time in vr it seems like they just drop at your feet because it doesn't register you actually moving your arm it just registers lose just dropping it <laughs> so they have actually, in this one, they've got a grenade trail, like the, the marker of where it's going, as well as kind of a point of impact area, just like a regular shooter would have, and you're just letting it go. You're not actually trying to throw it, kind of throws it for you, which that's perfectly fine in my opinion. There are some things that do not need to be extra complicated in VR uh, if you are going for the competitive route, which Firewall is. More of that in a second. You start out in a little training area, which is one of the best parts of the game. It's actually a pretty big training area. Uh, one thing that Firewall doesn't do, it doesn't have any teleportation mechanics. So if somebody is easily motion sick, you're, you're probably... It isn't... We had some people play that did get sick to their stomach a little bit easy, and they were able to do okay. Uh, myself, I felt a little bit of queasiness to start it, but it wasn't so bad after the fact. Um, as I moved around this area, this was a really big area. They have a lot of different things. They show you how to do all your throwables. They show you how to uh, all the different guns you can pick up and use. They show you the, the, the sniper rifle, how that functions. Didn't care for that as much because when you pull up the sniper rifle, it doesn't really get close enough to your eye to get a good look like the the scope gets a little bit bigger and that's about it like it, it to me I, I like better the whole block out my entire vision if if i'm going to be using a sniper rifle it just isn't as easy to get a good shot off when you're when you don't have a lot you can see um and then there is of course a training a training course where you go through and you try to you know time trial and see if you can get through without shooting your your the the bad guys. Uh, you shoot the bad guys and try not to shoot the good guys. Uh, no, I think your mic's a little bit hot. There we go. Um, anyways, as you're going through all this stuff, you then exit out towards the you know the hub where you're going to be playing the game. 
The interesting thing with Firewall, there's no single player component whatsoever. It is all multiplayer beyond that little training course. Everything kind of falls flat at this point. And that is because of just a bunch of weird decisions when it comes to Firewall. Let me start off with the modes themselves are really fun to play. They're definitely great. However, if I can't get into multiplayer matches, it doesn't matter. And lobbies have been constantly messed up. Uh, people showing up in my hub instead of the other hub that are on the other team, like just constant bugs, constant mess, mess ups, just annoyances. Went from there, and they do have a PvP mode or a PvE mode that is called Xfil. If you're like us, we had three people to be able to play. It we were able to get pretty far with it, uh, do pretty well with it. Cool, cool. If you're by yourself. <laughs> It's almost impossible because there are so many enemies coming at you. So you really don't even have a single player mode in this game. Uh, and you're going to have to try and matchmake, which again, they're having a lot of issues with matchmaking right now. As well as, I mean, uh, uh, as much as it stinks to say, PSVR 2 is going to be a very niche product. So an online multiplayer only. <laughs> just about game is going to be very tough to make work in this space. Uh, I feel like maybe if there could be some sort of bots implemented in multiplayer somehow, I mean, I'm we're talking, we were getting to three on three in lobbies and having to sit there until people started quitting, like put one bot on each team and just let it go. <laughs> Like it, it, it it's going to figure itself out somehow, especially as aggressive as the bots were in the PVE mode. Um, sorry, trying to remember exactly my train of thought with some of these. Another weird decision is, uh, so imagine in Call of Duty, if you ranked up, you unlocked AK-47 to be able to put in your loadouts. Imagine you want to run three different loadouts that has an AK-47 in it. Now imagine that you have to pay in-game currency for each AK-47 that you want to equip to a loadout. That is what Firewall Zero Hour is. You have to literally purchase an additional weapon for each loadout. Like, you, when I start off in the loadout screen, like there's one weapon that I actually have, and I have three of them <laughs> because there's one in each loadout slot. I don't understand why you don't start me out with several regular style weapons. Makes no sense at all. The progression system is odd in that the ranking up, I didn't gain a lot of rank just playing the game normally. I can set a, a challenges like i can choose challenges there are three in a day <laughs> and that's it like you you actually get tokens to spend on challenges so that i can't really grind all day i can only grind until i run out of challenges which is at least i, I don't know that they're that i wasn't able to play enough multiplayer matches to really work on them but it's a really weird system in that like, I don't understand why this was the choice, uh, especially in that, like, you'll have to you have to do so many things. Like one of the things in there was get 10 player. I think it was get eight player kills with a pistol. And it's like if I get into a match, I'm going to have to ace two straight ra two rounds just to complete that in one game. Lord, help me just getting to that one game. It's <laughs> The way that you level up and rank up and then the grossness, like I said, of having to per use your in-game money, which at least it's earnable, but just the grossness of having to – I should not have to go and, oh, I want to use a holographic sight on every weapon. I should not have to go buy four holographic sights from this. As soon as I unlock it, I need to have unlocked it. That's just That's just basic gaming at this point. I don't know that any other game that that occurs in. Um, and with that, it's like you, you move on to the actual modes. The modes are really good. You've got a, the, we talked about that there's a 
PVE mode called Xfil. You actually you go in, you of course kill the computer opponents, but you go to three different laptops on a map, which the maps are pretty neat. And you essentially start an upload and you defend that area and then move to the next laptop until it's time to get out of there. So it's it's fun. The the gameplay itself is pretty good, uh, pretty solid. The guns feel good to use. Uh, they, they're, they can be a little bit off, uh, but I feel like that's some of it's just the VR shakiness of you, you generally not aiming it as well as you think you're aiming it <laughs> when you're shooting in VR. And, you know, you just kind of go from there. The PvP is a really neat mode in that it's similar in the sense of they're try- the enemy team is trying to get the data from your laptop. And it's a three-round, best of three, you're defending and then attacking that laptop. And the way that they do it is you have a team that is, it's again, very Rainbow Six, and that you set up defenses on the map, and then you have the enemy team who goes and tries to, one, break through the firewall before they can get over to the laptop. So... And it's the same idea as search and destroy and there's limited lives. You, Everybody dies. That's the end of the round for that team. So really fun modes, modes that don't take that long. But that makes me feel even worse when I spent 20 minutes to get into a match that ends in less than five. Like it feels like a huge time sink that I'm getting nothing for for what I'm doing. With the currency, and then I mean, there's they already have monetization in this game. There's already a shop where you can buy operators that have specific perks and that are tied to them, and a season, uh, an operator pass, and stuff. And I'm like, there are other things that should have been focused on because I know when the game launched, there was even more issues than when we that we actually didn't encounter because they fixed them within a day or two because we didn't get a chance to play it right away at launch. It's just, it's very frustrating to watch a a team that's making all these decisions and it isn't decisions that incentivize the player to play. Like I should be incentivized to, okay, I want to grind to get this instead. It's like, well, crap, I can barely get into a match right now, which that's not completely, it's your fault and it's not your fault. This is a niche market, so it is going to be tougher to, to have a lot of people in grinding. But at the same point, you just made it way harder for me to rank up because it's tied to an arbitrary challenge system to get the best out of it, which is going to be – I'm not going to necessarily be able to grind because of these issues that you're having with matchmaking. And then, again, once I even unlock it, I'm going to blow all my money on stuff that I'm going to have to purchase multiple times if I think that one gun is the better gun. Like it, it's just it's there's so many little annoyances in the middle of a game that is very solid has some really good pieces to it but other pieces are not very good. Like it's, just, it's frustrating. <laughs> Cuz I I really was I was excited for Firewall because it was the more it, it was the it was the better, in my opinion, of of the ideas of we're going to go full on military shooter with this. Like it's, it's going to be the more realistic one. And instead, the they're wasting some really solid gameplay, some really solid gameplay modes. It's it, they took one thing that was super cool that I I really love the idea of, and which is if you close your eyes, you avoid flashbangs, or if you look away, like that is super cool to me. Like that's a VR thing. And it's just, uh, it's wasted <laughs> because I can't play the game to actually do it. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's Firewall Ultra. <laughs> we, uh, we went with review in progress because honestly, it's not a finished game. And I don't feel right attributing a score to something that really isn't finished. Okay. So how does that juxtapose with? Crossfire was a Sierra squad. Yes. Uh, obviously, I hear the name Crossfire and I'm like, eh. <laughs> because Crossfire and me do not have a good, uh, 
a good relationship. <laughs> no, is so. This is the same crossfire, Sa- same developer, same, bre- same oh, universe. Oh yep. boy! Oh uh, boy! <laughs> so, what's funny is this is probably better, and it's because it doesn't take itself seriously. At least I hope it's not. Like it's going to come out. There's going to be some interview with the de- developers talking about how real the game is, and I'm going to be like, uh, no. <laughs> uh, but this one definitely feels like. So the the first thing that comes to mind when I play it's it's it is you remember the on you know all the on on rails shooters and arcades like the time oh, crisis yeah. and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. That's what this game is, except it's not on rails. Like and I say when I say that it's not on rails. What I mean is you're pretty much moving in a straight line in an alley the whole time. Hmm. So it might as well be on rails. They're just requiring me to walk <laughs> with my with my stick. That's literally the only difference between this and an on rails shooter because of the way the levels work. Like it, it hmm. might as well have been an on rails shooter. Like. It just re- truly like there's so many spots where oh I'm at the end of the level how do I know that because I literally can't move any forward anymore like I'm I'm stuck behind a wall that I cannot move past like it's it's that kind of like it, it even has the whole you walk up if you go too far up like the game will tell you to that you can't anymore like you you get warned of moving too far up in the boundary. Are are the levels just that linear? Or are you um, just that mostly, contained? You, you're that contained in a lot of areas. Uh, there was the, the problem is is even the ones that feel kind of open. I'm assuming it's just the limitations of the hardware of what you can actually do. Uh, there was one mission that's actually a really neat mission where it's a, a snow mission. And you're moving around and stuff, and you actually have to pick up a sniper with a thermal scope because you can't see. But the problem is, I couldn't see. <laughs> so I didn't know where I was going. I'd have to pretty much look around with that scope just to see a thermal enemy to move in that direction. Like, we actually got lost at least once when we were trying to find our way around. And it, they're, they're, really, they're really bland levels. They're nothing pretty to write home about or anything like that is it's just pretty standard but even that one was still very linear with what you're doing most of these levels aren't going to take you longer than like 15 minutes and then when they end it's like the most like this is what we think america is like playing the rock music in the background it's like it's stock rock music that's playing like of of you beating the level oh yeah kind of like america kind of rock music and it's just funny the the best parts about this game is really that it is there's so many neat guns that they have and there's a you start off like your your start screen is pretty much a a shooting range (laughs) and the Barrett 50 cal is ridiculous. Like they definitely captured the like bombastic nature of guns in this game. Cause when you shoot a gun, you feel like you're shooting a gun in, in crossfire. What may be more funny is that every gun, if you don't pull your hand underneath it, if it is a two handed gun, as soon as you start shooting, the most Looney Tunes recoil starts going, and like your gun, like just sh- go straight up shooting. <laughs> what's even more funny is holding the mini gun because I don't think the game knows what's going on, so it's just shooting all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not holding it underneath, holding the handle. <laughs> So, but I mean, there are mortars in this. Like, I mean, there it's it's everything you could buy. Like, we we had some fun in the in the shooting range. I ran. <laughs> we were about to start a mission, and I said, "Hey, hold on, just a second. Ran up and grabbed a, a Simtex grenade, and I was like, "Hey, Ron, hold this." And threw it at him because <laughs> you're invincible <laughs> in that area. <laughs> it just started beeping and just blew up. <laughs> we were chasing each other with RPGs and. <laughs> grenade launchers like you can honestly spend an hour in just the shooting range running around doing stupid stuff 
and that's fun in and of itself. And like I said, the missions, even though they're on rails, they're they're fun enough. They just get bland after a while because you're doing the exact same thing over and over. It's the same reason that you don't sit there at an arcade over like four hours playing one of those games. It just gets old after a while. It's that's the issue that Crossfire has is it just gets old after a while. It's it's neat ideas. And there's a lot of it. There's actually 63 missions in this game. Like they've got like 13 campaign missions, like 50, I think it's 13 campaign, 50 squad, which are just, they're all the squad ones are real quick. And then they've got a horde mode, which is very, let's just say that it got real boring really fast because it's pretty much just guys with assault rifles, try to find cover guys with shotgun sprint, (laughs) occasionally drones show up and you have to shoot them down and they're annoying because they shoot grenades at you. And I said, it's it's more, it's, it's more of a cartoony arcade game compared to what Crossfire is. So they're two very different games, but the funny thing is I think Crossfire would be great if it just had multiplayer. Hmm. Like, That's I what I was about to ask. Some, is there no PVP? Could, there is, there is no PVP at all in this game. And it's actually very limiting on your missions because the 13 single player mission, the 13 campaign missions are all single player. There's no co op at all. The squad missions, the 50 of them, are only two players at max. And only the horde mode is up to four people. So it's, it's looking into limiting how many people can actually play at the same time. Whereas Crossfire is like, ah, oh, screw you. We don't care if you play by yourself. We only want multiples. So it's like the the juxtaposition of one game that really wants to be this realistic shooter and that is focused on the competitive multiplayer side, while the other one is this like Looney Tunes arcade. Why don't we focus more on just one person kind of side? And it's just this interesting contrast, but neither of them manages to be excellent at what they do. Like Crossfire, probably, if I had to look at both of these games, Crossfire does it better, but only because I feel like I expect less. And not necessarily because of the name Crossfire, but because of the way the game presents itself. It doesn't present itself as this... Again, I feel I feel like the the presentation of being the more realistic shooter brings that pre, brings that expectation of okay, if I'm getting this realism, I've, I've got more expectation. Whereas the the more arcadey feel allows Crossfire to have less expectations, and because it's better in terms of like, man, these guns feel good. This is fun to play when I'm playing it, even if it does get old then it manages to be better than I expect it's going to be. Whereas Crossfire is in with the, okay, gunplay solid, but I'm getting annoyed by all these other features, by all these weird decisions you've made in your currencies and your modes and, and your matchmaking also doesn't work very well. (laughs) So my expectation of it was a lot higher because of the cool ideas behind the realism. And then they, it didn't meet those. So just, just a very, I feel like it's a very interesting space to be in when you've got these games that are, should feel, you'd think if you looked at these side by side, just the pictures of them, you're like, okay, both of these games are going to cannibalize each other when it's absolutely the opposite. (laughs) They're both completely different games aiming at completely different targets. One of them misses and the other one at least hits the target, even if it's not a bullseye. I was... I've been playing through both Starfield and Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, which has been an awful experience just because trying to go through both of these very long games... It's not been going well in terms of my ability to actually progress through them in a substantial way. I feel like I will finish them sometime November, both of them. <laughs> but I've 
I'm enjoying them more. My problem is with this kind of games, Tears of the Kingdom, Starfield, they get off to really slow starts at times. Uh, Breath of the Wild also got off to a slow start, and it got me thinking about developers, they want to hook you from the beginning. I know they do. And so when you have a situation, David, you said yourself, Starfield starts a bit slow. I've heard across the internet that no, It's like people, every review. <laughs> yeah. Starfield starts slow. Some people fell off because Starfield was so slow. I've had to kind of force myself through at times because it it's been so slow. The payoff is, is coming. I'm being more engrossed in it. But S Tears of the Kingdom starts off a little faster, but still relatively slow. Um, you don't just kind of get into it. We're doing the fun stuff, or at least we're engaging with the fun stuff as we're being tutorialized at the same time. And I think Japanese games tend to struggle with tutorializing things more so than other regions and, and other regions that make games because they, they kind of they kind of micromanage you as you do it. So it really sucks the energy and the pace out of these kind of games. Zelda has that kind of feel to it, which contributes to the slowness. But it got me thinking, if I had to choose, would I rather have a slow start? Or would I rather it get slow during the middle and I kind of feel like I've gotten to a point where I don't want to progress any further there? So I ask you guys, would you rather have a slow start to your game? Or it gets slow in the middle. Anyone jump in? Uh, I I very easily slow start. I would prefer that because I played a lot of JRPGs. I'm used to it. <laughs> I'm used to it taking. <laughs> You've been conditioned. I've been conditioned, and which for me, um, I'm trying to look at the, how the camera. I, I'd rather the I guess intensity or like the action in my games i would rather it do this than do that if that makes sense like sure. i would rather i would rather have you'd it rather have, yeah you rather have escalation rather than the valley yeah because i for me when i'm playing a game the thing that hooks me before most things is the characters the world and the story that, that's what I look for first and to hook me in a game just personally. So um, I'm fine with the action and all the mechanics and stuff being slow at the beginning. Um, Cause I, that, that gives me time to become invested in the characters, the setting, what's going on, you know, what are, why is everyone doing, you know, these things, who are they? Um, and also, you know, for me personally, I I tend to remember like the final two and three acts of games versus, you know, out of all three acts, if you want to break each game down into three acts. So I'd rather have the, because I mostly remember the final two, I'd rather those be the, you know, the highlights and the fast action -y components versus it kind of slugging down in the middle. Well, here's the thing, though. Like, you really need. I feel like I'm used to there being a valley, though. After the after the beginning, like that's where you're just kind of in the nitty gritty grind of the game. Um, when you start, I like to have that moment, like set set that hook, get get me into the game. Uh, with something I brought it up in review with Fallout, you had that vault open, that that breathtaking moment when you looked out of the expanse. You're like, I'm gonna explore all that. And the down valley was the fact of you had to go explore all that. <laughs> so it was going to be slow, but it, you, you were presented correctly with it. You were presented with, the, with what you were going to be doing, what you were going to be grinding. You knew that was coming. Uh, and that's maybe even more what it's about is it's the correct presentation. It's one of the reasons that Zelda was, is able to, was able to do what they did is their presentation was correct. Even with the opening being slower, 
because of the fact it followed the formula that Breath of the Wild set. Now, Breath of the Wild, again, I, I will fully agree. It, it definitely that it its opening was a lot slower comparatively to Tears of the Kingdom. Tears oh, of the yeah. Kingdom feels yes. like it's a lot more succinct. Uh, and because it's about the ability, because of the way it's about the abilities, I think that makes it better because those mechanics, at least in my opinion, was better than the whole just exploration. We've we've had that discussion on on why Tears of the Kingdom works for me compared to Breath of the Wild, but it, to me you need that you need that opening that that grab. Uh, that's what keeps me playing. Uh, that's what keeps me wanting to play because the thing is is I've got <laughs> it's going to sound really funny. I've got that rush, and so I start chasing that rush. And even though it's not there, I know that it'll come back. It'll be there eventually. Because there is, like, Starfield has several moments where, which are wow moments in the story. But, I mean, someone who is focused on the story, like myself, that didn't come even into play until, like, 15 hours into the story. Like, if, if well, you're that's not only focused on story, uh, just personally, there's some, there's some other really good missions that do happen earlier. But I'm talking just wow moment, like, in, in what I'm doing. Um you're just you're gonna be waiting a second, and maybe it was supposed to be the initial opening into the plan onto the planet, the the kind of that op- almost a vault opening, so to speak. But all I saw was this big barren mining planet <laughs> that I wasn't going to be exploring, and I think maybe the moment could have happened if you had that actual flight into space kind of like what they do have a, i know it's a horrible comparison but no man's sky that is one of the wow moments once you figure out all the stuff with your ship you get on it and you take off into space like that is you taking off and actually getting into space and starfield it's a cutscene, so you're robbed of that going into the expanse of space and i feel like you feel it in starfield you don't get that opening rush that makes you want to continue to hunt for the rest of the rush, which well, you def- know will will come. I'll, def- I'll defend Starfield in, in this front. I was intrigued. You know, you are the miner. You're going through the cave. You're talking to people. They're kind of tutorializing you in that way. Like, if you haven't played a Bethesda game like I have, like this is, you could talk to all kinds of people. You talk to anybody. You could talk to the main character. You talk to the old boy mining over here. Like, you could you could do stuff as it's yep. leading you down to the, the main part of the story. But yeah, the, the cut scene happens and then you are brought into more dialogue. So, <laughs> so then you're yep. walking around doing Heck, more you, dialogue. But, like you said, the best stuff happens before you even get to the character creator for crying out loud. <laughs> yeah. Which the character, yeah, that, that was a fun part too, but always fun. You don't get into, well, I'll say, it, I'll say it this way. I wondered what it would be like if Starfield started you in space in the same way every single Star Wars movie starts in space with something. Some sort of drama is immediately happening. And I I guarantee if you talk to Todd Howard, he probably considered that idea 100%. But You you know, it would have been really cool, and this is just me spitballing with, with this idea, but your whole in space thing your the crimson fleet show up and you fight them on the planet that you're that you're on as the mining and everything what would have been cool is you crash land out of space on that planet chased by the crimson fleet you make your way into a cave and guess what's there <laughs> This thing the, the, that leads you to the whole constellation. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what I was yeah. thinking. Now I uh, I don't want to get into like <laughs> Yeah, Starfield needed to start like Call of Duty. Like I, I'm not. No, no, no. I don't and that's not what that. it needs to be. <laughs> yeah, Bethesda is a story driven, and you know, Starfield, Elder Scrolls. Like, there's story elements to these things. But so it's, I, I, it's surprising how vague the story is, considering the history that we have from Bethesda. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm not aware of that history, but I I am experiencing that vagueness. Uh, the 
the idea of I'm looking for these these artifacts and we don't really know what they're doing so we're going to leave it we're going to leave its significance that we're going to make it sound really big but we're going to also uh hide how how big it, the significance of it so that way you yep. still have the ability or at least the feeling of yeah i'll go do something else and save that for later uh, you know you don't feel bad yeah. about being tied to the story at least that's the way the design feels right now but it's not until you're actually able to go off and do, like now that i'm on the moon and i'm like kind of exploring and just doing whatever like i feel more free and it feels more invigorating yeah. in that way like i could go do the story if i wanted to i could go do whatever else i feel intrigued to do and that is exciting but it took about two and a half hours to get there and maybe longer um and it was just like why did it have to be like this <laughs> like I, I wish i wish i kind of got that a little bit faster no it looked like you wanted to say something oh it just made me think of like the whole slow start like one of the reasons i suppose i'm so fine with it and chill is i'm a big fan of the the shonen animes and it's like hey you know the meme of hey this this show this story's really good once you get past 50 episodes you know i hear that and i'm like it's worth the you know it's worth <laughs> the wait let's go most people hear that and they're like no thank you but so. here's the thing like the 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 closest thing i can think of right now that that i've seen that mimics that was the obi-wan kenobi series for for star wars a lot of people thought that was really slow and it you know the end is where the action was and you know that's where it really got interesting and i watched that whole part thing of that was sorry i was just saying we found out part of that was because it was a movie they got lengthened into a tv show <laughs> oh well that's interesting yep <laughs> didn't know that but i felt like the exposition of all of it that led up to the end was interesting. I recognized it was slow, but I thought the inter the interrelationship drama between the Inquisitor and Obi Wan, you know, like all this stuff that was his own like stuff that he was battling. I I did think that was interesting, even though it wasn't very action heavy and things like that. And I wonder, and even Noah, I want to ask this to you. You mentioned, you know, it's not, you know, a lot of JRPGs don't have, I won't say a lot, but some JRPGs don't have a ton of action at the beginning. Instead, they have a lot of exposition, but I feel like you can still have some really interesting and intriguing exposition, even though there's not a bunch of action necessarily, and it can still be invigorating and interesting and you want to know more. Would you agree with that? Oh yeah, I, I agree. Well, and I think that's one of the th things that I guess I don't. When I'm playing, some people are being like, "Man, that was really so slow start." You know, it, it took a while for things to get going, and I guess for me sometimes I just don't pick up on it because I'm too busy being invested in the characters and trying to figure out things and how the world's working. So, I think if they do a good enough job to, you know hype up and give unique and an interesting you know storyline from the beginning then if you do hold off on the action or like to really kick things up in gear or the action um not even of the like the gameplay of the story for things to start picking up if you can do that i think that's kind of where you get these like really good experiences well, and I think Starfield, part of the reason it struggles with that, though, is because when you're chasing the story, you're chasing inanimate objects instead of characters. So you don't, you won't always get the characters, the, the build of the characters, because you're chasing something that literally has no personality to it. Mm. You're, you're chasing an unknown. And while the theme of the, really, of, of the entire story is discovery that's not going to matter to someone who's sitting there looking for something to engage them. 
Like that's why people are raving about the side content. Why? Because you're engaging with characters in the side content and, and not this vague entity that you know nothing about until 10 hours into the game. But you're That's also discovering things this. as well when you engage with the side content to add on to what you're talking about, because you're right, Starfield is about discovery. So if you're not discovering the thing, the main thing for another 10 hours, then it's really uninteresting to to follow up on that. But the yep. the I guess for me, yes, I, to answer my own question, I I would rather have a slow middle. Like you got because if, if I drop off in the first, you know, hour or whatever, like I don't know what I'm missing, and I, you know, I'm gone. I feel like if I if it gets slow in the middle, I've had a good start, and so the middle, I could kind of at least kind of push myself through because I know this beginning gave me something. I can imagine this end is probably going to give me something. I just got to wade through this little interesting middle ground right now. Tales, Tales of Arise had kind of that middle where it's just like, oh my gosh, like it's not that it was necessarily boring, but it did drag on. And I did feel at times just like, I, I want this to be over. And in fact, a bit of that happened near the end, whereas like I feel like this end is being extended longer than it needs to be. Can we end this so we can get to the main point of it all? So maybe maybe that could be considered middle. I don't who knows how I guess how long middle. I guess we could define that however you want. I'll consider that middle. But once we got to the end, it was like, aha, okay, we're climbing. Here we go. Boom. It just took a really long time to get there. But once we got there, oh, it was it was so good. I just had to get through it. But if I never, if the beginning was slow like that, oh my God, yeah, I would have never, ever made it to the end. Absolutely not. Oh, see, I, I'm kind of the opposite. I, I get excited when I'm like, hey, things have been kind of slow. They're, they're setting up all this stuff. And if I know that the oh, game- Oh, yeah, man, nothing to a, do. I love this. The, the trajectory- is going up it's like hey i'm about to hop on the roller coaster let's go you know like it's there's not going to be any you know drop off wait wait you just you just said let's get on the roller coaster what does roller coasters usually have you have the high at the very beginning and then you have the drop. no see no but see, he's talking about that slow like clack, 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 clack. yeah but like it's building anticipation up. so so uh, so all so all noah likes is anticipation that's what we're getting at <laughs> well i I will say no. It does seem like you're focused on story aspect. I'm I'm also including like what's happening with what you're actually doing within the gameplay, right? And so I think that's why Starfield is an interesting discussion right now because story wise, yeah. But but it speaks to kind of both of the things that we're all talking about. Like story wise, it can get a little slow because you're not necessarily engaging with characters. And then gameplay wise, you're not necessarily discovering things or at least discovering the main thing that you're looking for the entire time. So you have to kind of find ways to keep yourself interested, which the game seems to do that fine on its own. It allows you to do that at least. And so it sounds like with you, like story wise, you're good with setup. You're good with anticipation. You, you'll take all the dialogue. You'll mm -hmm. you'll soak it up, see what it leads to. But gameplay wise, how would you respond to that? I, it depends, I guess, on the kind of game. For me, like if you're going to just not give me like the bare bones of gameplay, which sounds like what Starfield has done, and then you know later on hours in then you kind of start to expand on anything that probably should have been done a little bit sooner <laughs> like you have to give them enough to hook them you have to show off enough of the gameplay the core concepts to at least let people know what it's about and not wait 10 hours to be like oh there's this to do but i'm trying to think for me i i still even gameplay wise um if I can just get enough of an idea of how the game is supposed to be, I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it starting off slow and then shooting up and not kind of valleying as we've been talking about it. I don't know. I'm a patient man. What can I say? That's fine. 
ain't nothing wrong with the patience. That at least people will know, like, hey, if Noah didn't like a game, they're like, hey, he at least put like 10, 15 hours into it. You know, because I, oh, yeah. I will get, I'll get into the second act. I will put time into a game just to see. Yeah, if it doesn't, if it doesn't hook me, I got too many games to play. You got to hook me. You got to hook me. Well, that's that's probably the worst part because of the way this year has been. Like, Starfield's competing with you know Final Fantasy sixteen. Uh, Baldur's Gate 3, Tears of the Kingdom, Jedi Survivor. I mean, we we could go up and down the list and there's stuff that ain't even on it yet. You're competing with all these things. You you can't just trust that your players are eventually going to get into it. Yeah. Uh what was it? Uh Pokemon Legends Arceus. Oh my god. I wanted to play that game so bad, but they spend like an hour like over tutorializing everything and it's like yo like people have played pokemon games before like respect their time it's okay it's pokemon maybe the three people who haven't played sure go ahead let them be tutorialized but for the people who kind of have an idea of how this will go simplify this please and that's a funny thing starfield like under tutorializes some things to where you're like wait a second i need to know this (laughs) Why did oh, yeah. you not tell me? <laughs> hey, you got a what ship. I can this buy is a how boost? you change things. Okay. <laughs> what, I can buy a boost pack and can't use it until I have a perk? <laughs> yeah. <It was> discovery. <laughs> You're always... Dis- <laughs> they're allowing you to discover things. <laughs> That's what that sounds like to me. For better or for worse. But that's what I was thinking about. I wanted to get your thoughts on that it's a good question it's definitely a good like philosophy question like how you know devs have to be like okay how are we going to plan everything out you know i wonder if they ever go through that whole thought process oh absolutely they probably think that out before they uh before they really even start building the game um you know they they either written it out or you know storyboard it storyboards yep yeah uh so yeah, they they absolutely work that stuff out. So that's why I I imagine I I asked Todd Howard what were some ideas you were thinking about in starting Starfield. I guarantee you, one of them was just starting off in space. You know, some interesting to happen where it doesn't necessarily fully let you see the 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 expanse of it. And then they lead you down to a path where it's like, oh my gosh, this is what we get to do. Ooh-wee. But it's also probably something they probably wouldn't go down that route because at the end of the day, you really can't explore space in the way that you can in No Man's Sky, right? So they they wouldn't want to give you that kind of carrot for that. So, But still, the idea of it, you know. I do find it fascinating, you know, just flying through space right now, just being out there. It's pretty cool. It's fun. That little early stealth mission. I was like, I could do this. Yeah, this is fun. All right. Well, that'll do it for us. Appreciate y'all watching. Appreciate you listening. David will be back in his hometown with a real mic, not in the airport, scared out of his mind, wondering if security will come him talking about i loved watching david look up every two words when he was talking about air uh the vr games just to make sure security (laughs) wasn't coming to take him away it's more that i'm adhd so i'm being distracted by someone debarking as i look up (laughs) (laughs) you're wondering is the flights early yep so we'll see you next week deuces